Um, so first of all, my generous thanks go to Claudia and Anne for having me as, uh, um, as a speaker within this very inspiring, um, very inspiring framework of short lectures. Um, in the talks that have preceded this one, um, I think linguistics has been presented with reference to the different um, aspects um, and connections that linguistics has to the different societal um, aspects and notions. So I, I looked at the program and it was, uh, it was fascinating. So linguistics in connection with the law, I'm referring to forensic linguistics or gestures. So there was a lecture on the grammar of sign languages. Um, and even something more trivial like telephone apps. I'm referring to the uh, lecture given by Professor David Britton and his idea to track um, British dialects using that. Um, so as the title of my talk suggests today, um, we turn to two rather complex societal notions. I say complex but also fascinating. Legitimacy <coughs> and identity, of course from a language perspective. So um, in a nutshell, my, my talk is on the linguistics behind the way the EU talks to us, the citizens. So I've always been intrigued by how the European Union tries to represent itself through this course in order to come across as, I would say, a legitimate polity. So how do they actually sell themselves to us as citizens? <coughs> OK. Um, I seek to explore how EU discursive practices have changed over time. So I'm really <coughs> intrigued by, uh, I wouldn't say diachrony, but longitudinal approaches to this course analysis. Um, in an attempt to address uh, what we know is, so the idea is how to, uh, is to understand how the European Union is, um, uh, is trying to tackle this uh, legitimacy crisis within the Union, which we know is facing different forms of opposition. Uh, I'm referring specifically to two, what have been defined as the two most critical or disruptive moments in the recent history of the European uh, Union. So the first one is the rejection of the draft constitutional treaty in 2005 and more recently um, the uh, leave vote expressed by uh, UK citizens uh, a couple of two years ago. So uh, I would like to understand how the EU seeks consensus in these difficult times through a language analysis that investigates the evolution of the strategies used to buy consensus. Right. So in this study, the emphasis is on, um, first of all, I look at the dialectical <coughs> relationship between this course and the institutional structures within which uh, this course is framed. So, as I will introduce briefly with reference to my theoretical framework, uh, this course change is believed to reflect and in turn be reflected by um, sociopolitical transformations. Secondly, in order to understand how change happens and how change takes place, I rely on the dynamic connection between the two notions of discursive change and discursive shifts. So this may sound a little odd, to uh, people who have never dealt with critical discourse analysis, but it's also quite insightful. So um, this course changes a macro dimension, uh, which can be observed at micro level through discursive shifts. Uh, <coughs> Nikolaj Shishonovsky, who is a famous critical discourse <coughs> analyst, uh, believes that uh, discursive shifts are, in a way, micro level appropriations of global changes. <coughs> Um, for global changes, you might think of um, phenomena like globalization or neoliberalism and how these events or phenomena change the way we speak. So if you think of neoliberalism, there was a very uh, interesting study by Jessup in 2012. He speaks of uh, the economization of social relations that follow neoliberalism. So in today's society, everything is very property-oriented and language, so this course is shifting towards practices that are very marketized. 
<coughs> this is what we're going to look at today. So the way institutions appropriate language practices that are typical of the language of the private sector, of marketing, of advertisements. So they have a sort of corporate voice. And having said that, I cannot overlook uh, genre analysis. So I'm going to take a look at how specific features that are normally associated to even institutional genres change over time. Okay, so this is more or less my roadmap. Uh, try to give you a little bit of uh, references to my theoretical framework um, and explain how I'd like to contribute to the literature. Um, and also um, present you with my corpus and tell you more about the discursive shift that I want to look at. And finally, I will present my results, try to see what the future <coughs> holds for this, for this type of research. Okay, uh, how many of you have heard about critical discourse analysis before? More or less. Oops. So this, this study is couched within the theoretical framework of uh, called CDA, so Critical Discourse Analysis, which is an interdisciplinary branch of linguistics. It is informed by a number of epistemological traditions from uh, Habermas to Foucault and post-structuralism. Um, CDA is positioned primarily in the milieu of pragmatics and um, discourse analysis, and is based on systemic functional grammar, so social semiotics, linguistics, of uh, Michael Halliday. It's actually the first time I mentioned Halliday ever since he <coughs> passed away three weeks ago. And it's rather odd. Um, one of the tenets of CDA is that this course is not only socially conditioned, but it shapes reality. So the way we use language shapes the way we are, become, or assert our identity. In a way. I don't know if you would agree, but it's certainly something to think about. Of course, this idea is not new. It's derived from um, a social, a social theorist, <coughs> Michel Foucault, who believes that uh, the role of this course is crucial in creating identities, in legitimating our identities, but also in um, expressing relations of power, especially when power is institutionally reproduced. <coughs> OK. My study is um, it's not alone, <laughs> as you can see. So this is more or less what has been done over the last few years. Uh, there is an interest in the way the European Union constructs itself through this course. Sometimes people working for the European Union are not aware of this. And more recently, I've, I've had some <coughs> talks to, uh, with uh, Eurocrats, and they are really not aware of what is being done about EU discourse. Uh, these studies have been trying to seek and uh, detect processes of identity construction within Europe, but also um, on the frontiers of Europe, if you think of enlargement and how this actually shook the foundations of the European Union. So in which way um, is, my school, is my study um, innovative or different? Well, first of all, I uh, would like to uh, work on an overview of EU discourse in the field of communication policy. So I'm, I'm really intrigued by how the EU speaks to us, the citizens. Uh, so I look at informative genres. I don't look at technical texts. I don't look at mm, sorts of uh, specialized texts, but very popularizing uh, ones. Secondly, my study, as I said before, looks at the evolution of the time, at least I, I hope it does. And, um, <coughs> and it is informed by um, a theoretical, methodological framework called uh, which stands for a corpus assisted discourse studies, in the sense that the results of a qualitative analysis are vouched for, so they are strengthened by some uh, data, by some figures and percentages. Um, so, in this respect, the study is in a way couched within a more um, modern trend. So, they combine <coughs> critical discourse analysis with corpus linguistics because. Um, the idea is to avoid cherry picking. So critical discourse analysts have been oftentimes accused of just selecting the excerpts and passages they like and say, okay, this is evidence that. So we want to <coughs> provide some objective evidence to avoid such criticism. 
Okay. Um, and this very last point is something I feel very strongly about. So this study tends to, well, uh, intends to exploit the discourse politics interface. This is more of a scientific challenge in the sense that uh, if you think of this series of lectures today to discover linguistics, linguistic discoveries, uh, the idea is, okay, we want to know more about linguistics, but we also want to exploit linguistics so that it makes us, lets us understand more about the world we live in. So my um, intention is to combine linguistics and this course analysis with other disciplines. In this specific case, political studies or European integration studies. So my study seeks to include linguistics um, in the range of approaches to European studies. This synergy might prove beneficial and we will see why or how. Uh, unfortunately, the role of this course has been neglected for a long time within linguistics sometimes, uh, but uh, by other disciplines as well. Um, whereas I believe that this course analysis would greatly contribute to a field such as history mm -hmm. and, and, of course, political science. Um, there is a political scientist called Thomas Heath, and he believes that discursive approaches to European integration studies um, are actually helping us to conceptualize Europe and European governments. I don't know if you would agree. But uh, this is something new. It's quite, uh, it's quite innovative. Nobody has ever said something like this before. Um, so it is a bit of a theoretical challenge today. Um, and throughout this study, I'm going to introduce you to some theories derived from political science. And I want to test them so they've already been elaborated. I would like to test those very same theories from a discursive perspective. I'll just give you an example. This is a taxonomy uh, propounded by um, Erickson, a political scientist. Um, so he works on legitimacy in the EU. And Erickson believes that in order to be legitimized, <coughs> in order to uh, come across as a participatory, acceptable, democratic enterprise, the European Union, Union should offer something to its citizens. So his theory says, that citizens should see in the EU some sort of significance, some sort of meaning, some sort of uh, utility. Um, and the EU in itself just should become salient in our lives, a tangible presence. So he, uh, he theorizes and put, puts forward three um, identities that the EU could take on in order to legitimate itself. The first one is the, uh, the role of uh, the problem solver. <coughs> so the EU is acceptable or respectable as long as it solves our daily issues and offers benefits and tangible um, advantages. The second model uh, conceives the EU as a provider of common values and then as a provider of rights. So in my study, I argue that these new identity roles emerge clearly through this course and this first shifts. Um, so we'll try to look at these uh, identity roles in the text that we uh, examine together. Okay, so very quickly, uh, the idea is that um, in its text, the <coughs> European Union is increasingly promoting some um, sorts of um, utilitarian and instrumental principles. So the intention is to come across as a tangible, real presence. They, they call it the reification of the European Union in our lives. Okay? So for example, for you, it would be important that the EU gives you the opportunity of going abroad uh, through the Erasmus program, okay? or gives you funds if you want to start with an initiative, or if you want to um, present a project and have some economic help. Okay, so what is it? What's, what's there for me? What is the EU giving me um, as a citizen? EU institutions are gradually, in a way, stepping away from the declamatory rhetoric of the past. So up to 15, 20 years ago, it was all about democracy, the rule of law, peace. Whereas today, uh, it is really stressing the tangible benefits that derive from, from membership 
So higher efficiency, supranational mobility, better job opportunities, and all in all, higher living standards. Okay, so this translates into what we call interdiscussivity. So the EU <coughs> institutional resource is gradually appropriating uh, features that are non-institutional in principle. So they really use this language that is very corporate in nature. And uh, we will see that uh, it is increasingly promotional, informal, dialogic, and in a way, um, young. Okay? So it really recalls the, uh, the language of, um, um, of the corporate market. Um, Fairclough had actually uh, predicted this, uh, this trend um, by calling it marketization of public discourse. So public discourse appropriating traits and features of the discourse of the, pub, of the private sector. And this is also happening in the, in the academia, in the university. So professors, faculty members, they are actually being assessed and publications are called research products. You have credit, that is something that, of course, has started a long time ago. Okay, so uh, as far as my corpus is concerned, <coughs> I'd like to introduce the text I've been working on. So since I wanted to see how the EU represents itself to us, the citizens, I thought the most obvious choice would be to look at the Europa website, because this is the main channel of communication between them and us. Um, luckily enough, uh, Europe has a sort of uh, storage space where they um, collect all the uh, informative material. So all the publications, the popularizing and informative publications are stored in this um, section which is called the EU Bookshop. And it's a broad <coughs> reaching space that gathers and disseminates uh, information booklets on everything from agricultural policy to external relations. Everything you want is, is, is there. Uh, so I've used this, um, this container to build my corpus, which is called uh, Eurocom. Um, it is, I'm going to introduce this in a minute in more details, but um, I've used this corpus to compare how EU discourse has changed over a 10 uh, year, so a timeline of 10 years, uh, before and after 2005, so the big constitutional treaty crisis, you remember when France and the Netherlands rejected the treaty. Unfortunately, uh, I wanted to build a similar corpus to um, sort of um, gauge the EU mood <coughs> on Brexit. Um, and I wasn't able, of course, to, to build such a big corpus just yet. Uh, because I found out that um, the EU has been rather secretive about Brexit or the risk, the threat of Brexit. So um, the Commission especially adopted a very sort of discreet uh, communication policy in the five month run up to the uh, referendum. So if you think of February 2016 when Cameron secured his deal with the European Council <coughs> until the date the referendum on, um, on EU membership, the UK referendum on EU membership took place, there was silence. And the um, European Union explicitly said that uh, this is um, a reply to uh, a parliamentary question. So this is Juncker replying to a parliamentary question. He's saying that Brexit, um, these are matters for the British government and for the British people. So there were, at the time, no publications, official publications, on what was going on. The only interesting genre I found at the time was, as I said, I really wanted to gauge, I really wanted to understand how the EU was reacting to, to Brexit or to the, of course, to the sort of um, steadily approaching risk of, of Brexit. Uh, at the time, uh, I can look at this genre, which is a series of blog posts. I don't know if you've ever come across this, uh, this page. Um, so these blog posts are called Euro Myth. Um, it's actually not within the Europa website itself, but it is the um, European Commission representation of the UK. Um, and they have a page called Euromit. So these are blog posts through which the European Commission um, discredits, or um, actually, um, I would say, rebuts um, and discharges fake accusations. So it's a response <coughs> to fake 
news on the European Union. You know how bad uh, the press is in the UK as far as the European Union is concerned. And this gives you an idea because this Euromed blog posts have been published since 1992. So we have over 600 blog posts uh, on everything. So A to Z, from A levels to zoo issues. And um, the interesting thing is that in the five month run up to the referendum, uh, the number exploded. So they were publishing blog posts, trying to dismiss this fake accusation. They say they, they sound, uh, they have messages along the lines of, uh, it is not true, uh, the <coughs> European Union doesn't want to banish English pubs, or are not going to abolish mince pies, you know, things like that. And it just tells you a lot about the, what the UK was actually looking at, what the EU membership meant to them. Unfortunately, this uh, drama was rather distant from the information booklets. Um, and uh, luckily, more recently, the European Union has started to issue booklets, information booklets on Brexit. This has started precisely last year, so when Theresa May um, has actually triggered Article 50, and that was <coughs> the inception moment, so the, 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 the booklets um, started to uh, come afloat, and actually they're, they're being written as we speak. Um, the disappointing uh, data is, um, I mean, as you could see, or maybe not see, because it's, 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 it's written, the caption is rather small, but uh, most of these publications are very technical in nature, so they are studies commissioned by uh, the DG um, for internal policies of the Union, so they're very sorts of specialised texts. Um, but the little, uh, a little slice there represents the um, number, the percentage of information booklets. So very few, a handful of these booklets. This is why today I will just give you some preliminary data on, uh, um, on booklets on Brexit. So I will just give you a, um, <coughs> an overview on EU discourse using the Eurocon corpus, which is statistically significant representative of EU discourse, and then I compare some of the features that, that are emerging with the preliminary results on the Brexit corpus. Okay, so um, apparently the biggest revolution in the communication policy of the European Union has a date and a name. So 2005, the um, disappointing results of the constitutional treaty referendum. Uh, at the time, as you know, France and the Netherlands rejected by a large majority the, um, the uh, Constitutional Treaty. And this crunch vote at the time um, sent shockwaves through the establishment. Um, in 2005, <coughs> for the very first time, it became painfully clear that something needed to be done. It's interesting because before then, um, the narrative of the union was very fairy tale like they never admitted to anything so they were like okay everything is fine and then the shock comes and they start speaking about it from 2005 onwards and that's when they realize that a makeover of their communication policy was actually needed <coughs> okay this is what happened at the time this is just a selection of all the initiatives that have been undertaken for, um, to, in a way, refresh the communication policy. Um, a period of reflection started. It was called, um, actually, a reflection on the future of Europe. And I find this very interesting because the very same thing is happening now. In 2017, so just last year, the European Union has published a white paper on the future of Europe. So you see history repeats itself. So all these um, white papers, all these initiatives and measures had intention to, so they were seeking to uh, change the way the EU was talking to us, was communicating its uh, aims, uh, objectives and purpose. Um, the idea was to communicate more clearly and at the same time make EU's activity more appealing, sexy to the citizens. Um, so the problem, according to the EU, was that there was not enough knowledge about the European Union. So uh, the lack of knowledge about the EU 
was one of the major impediments to fostering greater appreciation. So we tell you more so that we, you will embrace the project. And this is, I think, what happened, what they say happened with Brexit. So they always accuse the UK of not knowing enough about the European Union. This is why uh, there is lack of consensus or motivational vacuum. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to look at these uh, initiatives and my ideas to observe how these um, measures translate into what we were calling before discursive shifts. So how this actually changes and microscopically in the way they speak. <coughs> um, so to tackle these questions, I have built um, this corpus, which covers a period of 10 years. This is the biggest existing corpus of EU in format of this course. So it's about half a million uh, tokens, not enormous, but quite um, significant. Um, in order to detect, as we said, the change after 2005, the corpus is subdivided into two subcorpora. So we have the pre-referendum corpus and the post-referendum one, five years prior to and five years after the <coughs> referendum. Um, the idea is to tease out how these disappointing results have affected EU discourse. Of course, you understand that the pre-referendum -re corpus acted as, um, as the reference corpus against which the saliency of the new corpus was actually um, um, tested. Uh, I was lucky enough, so I, I, I could work with the University of Antwerp for, um, to strengthen uh, the potential of this corpus. Um, because the texts were tokenized, lemmatized, and part of speech text for word category disambiguation. And it's now actually freely available on the internet in case somebody wanted to use it for further research. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. Uh, an aspect that enhances the contrastive nature of this analysis is the direct comparability of nine booklets. So within this big corpus, there is a minor, the sort of smaller <coughs> um, section, which is uh, represented by nine booklets, which were actually um, edited after 2005. So you have the very same booklets that are just modified in some interesting parts. Uh, there are some very revealing uh, passages that are just changed in a way that revealed intentions of the European Union. So from a methodological perspective, these, these are the nine uh, booklets. You understand how precious the direct comparability of these two uh, subcorpora is, because I could see the microscopic changes and then understand whether they could be generalized and considered as trends, comparing them to the bigger corpus, so the, the whole Eurocom. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'll just briefly explain what, uh, methodologically <coughs> speaking, that would be um, how I would proceed. So um, I would fir I first of all manually compared the nine booklets that have been published, sorry, edited after 2005 in order to detect some instances of language change that was impossible to track down with the corpus. Um, based analysis. And then uh, these emerging discursive features are checked against the wider corpus, as I said. I worked on the observation of word frequencies and gram concordances and collocational patterns in general. Um, I will uh, focus on uh, representation of the EU, looking at um, agentivity, uh, interdiscursivity, and the prioritization of certain lexical items, such as achievements successes and rights. Okay. So uh, the very first step of the investigation was to look at the way the EU presents itself. Okay, so here comes the EU. In which way are the institutions represented verbally, discursively? So um, I will look at some syntactic changes and the way the very same event is represented in a different way syntactically, of course. 
um, it's very um, impressive to see. So these are the, this is of course the subcorpus, the one I was checking manually. It's interesting to see how um, the very same, as I said, the very same event is represented and uh, formulated in a completely different way. So um, the EU <coughs> is increasingly observed to play the semantic role of agents. Okay? The idea is that it represents itself as the instigator of the action, uh, displaying features such as volition, responsibility, control. We can take a look at the uh, first example. So the EU structural funds help even out these differences by improving life in poorer regions. It becomes the EU, so 1B, the EU has created so-called structural funds. Okay? So in 1A, as you can see, the agent is grammatically um, underdetermined, whereas in the equivalent, so in the new version, um, the <coughs> EU is described as the volitional agent, okay? so very much in the forefront. Example number two is also very interesting. <coughs> EU policy aims to halt the loss of biodiversity, which becomes the EU's committed to halting the loss of biodiversity. Um, so in example 2A, the subject is agent of the through metonymy, okay? whereas you see then in 2B there is a very interesting shift. So the agentive role of the EU is made explicit, and also the action of halting biodiversity mm. loss is no longer described as a name, but it is a commitment on the part of the EU. So you understand that the verb commitment suggests volition, <coughs> engagement, empowerment, in a way. We also find the very same uh, verb, commit, in 3B. Okay? So these are similar instances of how the corpus, uh, how these booklets changed after 2005. So it's a sort of very strategic intention of uh, making the message more um, effective. Um, okay, so this manual search was just a starting point and then uh, I wanted to look at how the institutional actor was grammatically expressed in the bigger corpus. Um, so I checked the entire Eurocon corpus in order to see whether lexical units denoting the EU, the European Union or Europe uh, were in a way foregrounded. Okay, so you have some data here. <coughs> um, you see that the lexical unit uh, VEU, I think it's line number four, is a key biogram in, uh, in, um, in post referendum corpus. So we're talking about the bigger one here. So keyness, as you, as you, as you might know, represents the value of log likelihood. So it's an indicator of how typical, how strong a word is. Uh, according to a given setting, circumstances, or also uh, what we can expect. The list of trigrams and quadrigrams, I don't have it here, but they confirm a similar result. Um, I pushed it a little bit further. Um, so uh, once I had the results of the uh, biogram analysis, I wanted to go for a more fine-grained search to understand how this um, lexical units, so the EU, the European Union and Europe were actually being treated, where, where they were positioned within sentences in a text. Um, so after the constitutional treaty crisis, something very interesting happens. Uh, there is an increase in the statistical frequency of this lexical unit, so the EU, the European Union and Europe they increase in noun phrases that were in subject position in affirmative sentences. So basically, uh, we have um, some sort of very Eurocentric hmm, type <coughs> of um, An interesting trend is the sort of um, focus given to achievements and successes. This is sort of uh, um, uh, will call successes and achievements as new liberal buzzwords. So they go on and on about how successful they are and how many achievements they have they have reached. Um, so the EU expresses its active roles also through the um, targets it has reached. Um, some of the new booklets are clearly this sort of very uh, goal-oriented um, um, profile. 
Uh, you can see from this, this is an interesting one, which starts as, uh, this was published from 2006 onwards. So this book that is called The Snapshot of Achievement, and every single year you have a sort of budget telling the uh, citizens what has been achieved. And all these uh, targets and all these objectives are mainly economical in nature, very much related to citizens' uh, rights or consumer rights, very much consumer rights. Okay. Um, again, I compared the two subcorpora, and uh, I could see that, uh, again, a reformulation was taking place. Look at 6A and 6B. So an embryonic common defence policy becomes tangible achievements for security and defence. <coughs> what can you see here? A euro is the name of the single European currency becomes the euro is probably the EU's most tangible achievement. Similarly, 8A and B, they are quite uh, striking. Um, if, you, if you pay attention, the use of superlatives is, is making this a super achievement, a, a uber achievement. Okay? So this conveys a very hyperbolic description of the successes uh, and this is typical of the language of advertising. <coughs> if you read works by Greece and she works in the language of advertising, this is the very first thing that she points out. Um, here we're still working on the subcorpus. So what I did is I looked at the concordances of this uh, nouns, achievement and also successes. What I could see is that uh, after 2005, every single occurrence or achievement or achievements was pre-modified. And you see here the list of adjectives pre-modifying the noun achievement. Um, and I'm sure that you can tell um, how these uh, adjectives highlight the idea of tangibility, something which is concrete. We touch these achievements, are very palpable. Uh, and also unique and unprecedented. Hmm? This is interesting. So if we look at the uh, wider corpus, these are the most important collocational patterns, and they use keywords, successes and achievements are keywords in the near corpus. Um, so you have locutions like the EU's best successes and greatest achievements. Now, the use of these amplifiers and emphasizes your key, concrete, great, are associated by critical discourse analysts, especially Ruth Waldeck and her colleagues in the work published in 2009. So these um, amplifiers are associated to a, str a strategy, a rhetorical strategy called singularization. So I use lexical items that highlight um, the uniqueness of an event or an entity to create or to refer to the topos of the locus amenus. So what the EU is, is a special place like no other. And if you are a <coughs> member of the EU, you're entitled to greatest achievements, okay? Outstanding, spectacular. This is <coughs> almost ridiculous at times. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, as I said, the rationale behind this is that legitimacy is believed to take form in our mind, in our head, as long as the ego serves a purpose that is interesting for us. One of these achievements is the rights. I don't know if you've noticed that the European Union is really stressing uh, consumer rights and citizens' rights. So these are, um, <coughs> according to some political scientists, citizens' rights and consumer rights, are they represent a framework um, through which the EU can instill a sense of allegiance uh, to, into the institutions. This emphasis on rights is also very um, topical. One of the latest reports, so this is one of the latest initiatives in the field of information and communication policy, and you see how much they highlight uh, citizens' rights. Um, I could also, you can't actually read it here, but the little uh, caption, this is a series of uh, publications called Justice and Consumers. You see how this mm, binomial um, um, construction is extremely interesting because it puts together your rights and your identity as a consumer. Okay, um, so uh, back to our corpus. 
this focus on rights on the part of the European Union is blatant from this new uh, formulation. So these are passages that were just added ex novo to the new uh, booklets. And you see that, first of all, there is emphasis on protection of rights. So the EU is there, it's a guardian of your rights. Um, consumer protection, the word consumer is increasingly associated with the term um, citizen. So examples 9, 10 and 11, you have the binomial <coughs> expression citizens and consumers. Or in example 10, the preposition as expressing the state, the role. So citizen in the capacity of consumer. And also in 11, um, you have, uh, we have consumer. <coughs> um, in this case, it's interesting because consumer is the subject complement that follows the subject. So here, semantically speaking, you have more and more this nexus between the two roles, citizen and consumer. In general, as you can see from the use of uh, the verb <coughs> protect, which is uh, highlighted in bold, uh, the EU is, is very much maternal in this respect. So um, the idea is that the EU safeguards consumers and protects them against possible undesirable scenarios or unfair market practices. And also one last thing is that um, through the use of WH words, uh, the EU stresses the fact that this set of rights and entitlements are guaranteed throughout the EU, wherever you are, wherever you work or live. And this is very important to instill a sense of allegiance because we are part of a community that is harmonized. Okay, uh, right was not very important. So the, <laughs> as a lexical item in the uh, pre-ref uh, corpus, it was not key. And um, it would uh, keep company with uh, sort of predictable uh, words, so it would form the um, the string, the lexical string, human rights, fundamental rights. Whereas in the post ref corpus, the um, it is key, and the collocation group, the most uh, frequent collocation group, is your right and passengers' rights. So you see again the stresses on what is actually very utilitarian in nature: passengers' rights, other than human rights. The widespread use of possessive your in your rights tells us a lot about the uh, phenomenon of conversationalization of this voice. So the EU is speaking in a very snappy way, in a very informal and dialogic, as if we were talking to you as um, in an intimate or, or, or informal way. So conversationalization <coughs> of this course was uh, theorized by Fairclough. Uh, this is typical of public discourse nowadays, which is uh, becoming more casual, which is becoming uh, dialogical in the sense of willing to uh, prompt a feeling of closeness hmm? and proximity. And this is just one example of the bigger phenomenon, wider phenomenon of interdiscussivity of, uh, of institutional uh, language. I will not repeat myself, so it's about appropriating features that were sort of, um, they are somehow uh, unexpected and belonging to the private sector. Okay, so how does it actually happen? So the EU is making a lot of um, use of personal data, the use of pronoun you or possessive your, or there are numerous uh, forms of direct address through questions or um, even imperatives sort of exhortative constructions. Um, this is described by Fairclough as synthetic personalization. Synthetic personalization means the institution is treating you uh, in a way as if it was a one-to-one -one interaction. So they are simulating some sort of uh, intimate exchange. <coughs> Uh, this is interesting. So again, I follow the same method. I start from the subcorpus, from the manual search. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, U is actually very salient. Uh, this is an interesting booklet. It's called European 12 Lessons. And in this very booklet, the use of pronoun U abounds. Whereas you cannot even find one single occurrence of second person pronoun in the previous uh, version, not even for uh, impersonal constructions, never. And there you just have you <coughs> <everywhere. coughs> you see, 
every time you could, every time there is a sort of uh, uh, impersonal or indirect reference, like any person who is a national becomes you. So any person who is a national of an EU country uh, can be involved in providing health, education, and other public services becomes you can work in the health, education, and other public services. And uh, uh, this was blatant from the observation of the titles alone. You see? In the titles, you see how it just becomes rather cheeky. That is um, how the European Commission works becomes what the Commission does for you. So the, uh, the stress is not on the, on the process, but on the outcome. Okay, so what, what's in it for me, basically? Um, the all is also very interesting. I will just go quickly here. So part of the uh, synthetic personalization process. These are the most interesting semantic sequences and also the most um, um, recurring semantic sequences within the corpus. So you always used in, um, in um, as I said, semantic sequences like make your views heard, uh, make your voice heard, contact your MEP. So these are all exhortative constructions. Um, this is the uh, top key diagram uh, that shows you how important you and your are. So they are absolutely, they are key in the uh, Eurocom corpus. Um, it's interesting because sometimes we work on keywords using lexical words. So sometimes, well, <coughs> oftentimes, we, uh, we look at um, open class words to understand the aboutness of a text. So when you, when you do a keyword search, you look at open class words. Um, and I found, it, I found it interesting because according to, uh, to Groom and Gledhill, um, close class words like you or your are indicators of style. And it was precisely this change in style that I was looking for. A style that is becoming incredibly informal, incredibly promotional in a way, and, uh, and corporate. All right, so uh, one last aspect is the increase of uh, the use of questions. Of course, questions, they, they give this impression of intimacy. They mimic the start of a conversation, question and answers. Um, and also, what I found is the fact that uh, what, when formulating questions, pretending to formulate questions, pretending to speak like the, spe the, the citizens or consumers would speak, the EU stresses again this utilitarian sort of mission. Um, I think uh, questions are rather interesting. If I, if I can quote John Sinclair, they seem to have a, a <coughs> prospective signal. So here, these questions, they prospect forward. They guide the reader in the direction of a specific answer that best suits the purpose of the European Union. So just the EU is leading you towards the information they want to give you. Okay? So uh, here the EU comes across again as the protector, as the guardian of your rights and the problem solver. Okay, what happens with the Brexit corpus now? Um, I could see that most of these uh, <coughs> traits could be actually found in our uh, shared by the booklet, there are booklets that are starting to uh, uh, be published on Brexit. <coughs> um, as I said, my preliminary analysis of the, the work on these booklets cannot be considered as longitudinal, it cannot be considered as comparative, but this is just a first step towards a future um, a research project. So what I could see is that you have mostly everything there. You have synthetic personalization, use of first-person pronouns. So this is a book that's called EU Citizens' Rights and Brexit. Um, so interdiscussivity and conversationalization are there. A trend I have detected is the fact that the European Union you know, is always in the forefront. So it's always very much um, um, agented as a presence. But it is more and more using the pronoun we, and this had not happened before. So um, you see here, I'm sorry, it's, it's, uh, you can barely read. So we have said the guarantee in the rights of EU citizens. We want to ensure, we wish that these rights will continue to be protected. This is rather interesting. Maybe they just want to further the sense of intimacy or a form of personification of the institution. 
Uh, as you can see, citizens' rights are always very salient. So this is rather um, similar. Um, and these questions being asked are very functional, they're very to the point. So again, the EU is simulating these questions. They are asking questions for you. And they go along the lines of, do I still have my rights? Do I still hold my privileged position, given this sort of stormy uh, setting? Will I and my family be covered? Very utilitarian. Um, Content-wise, um, the statements that I found in these booklets are always acts of reassurance. So uh, they <coughs> offer certainty, reassurance, safeguards, and once again, this sort of problem-solving expertise. So they say, this is number one priority for us. We should take care of it. And this is the kind of the tone. Um, and this is rather predictable, of course, given the sort of atmosphere of uh, uncertainty that lingers upon the Brexit uh, talks. Um, and again, in these examples, you see that they are using we <coughs> to talk to us. So that, as I said, this is, a, this is something new. Uh, legitimacy uh, in the time of Brexit, uh, from a pragmatic perspective, I was actually very intrigued. Uh, I wanted to see how the EU was um, trying to save face. <laughs> Even the sorts of, uh, um, I could we say, sort of, uh, let's face it, Brexit is, is an image tarnishing event. Okay? So it's not the best possible thing that could happen to the institution. So I really wanted to see how they save face. Um, and Brexit is um, actually discursively played down in a series of instances. I don't have the time to show them all. But what I've noticed is that there are some sort of milder reformulations starting from the very now withdrawal. So this is formulated as disengagement, which sounds a bit more casual. Um, and what you could see from example 20 is that on the one hand, the withdrawal itself is being toned out, so they say disengagement. But on the other hand, as you might have noticed already, I'm sure you have. So what the EU, sorry, what the UK is disengaging itself from is nothing but <coughs> the historical European enterprise. So again, you have this topus of the locus amenus. There's something exceptionally historical enterprise. Um, so once again, um, this is uh, a strategy of positive self-representation. As we said, Walter Kenal described it as the um, singularization strategy, something unique that the EU is. Uh, Brexit was clearly um, a blow to the European Union, but it seems to be the, the EU is actually trying to spin Brexit to its favor. Uh, it is portrayed as an opportunity. This was actually quite surprising. Uh, and the EU stresses its positive aspects. What are the positive aspects of Brexit, one may ask? So Brexit is an opportunity. Um, the EU transforms this disruptive event into a success story. <laughs> okay? So again, throwing light on the positive aspects. Let's look at the example together. The shock of a Brexit seems to have reinforced the desire of permanence in the Union in almost all member states. You see, if you think of semantics here, I'm sure you know what an entailment is. See, the shock of the Brexit seems to have reinforced the desire of permanence in the Union. The entailment is there was a desire of permanence in the Union, right? This may come as a surprise to many, but <laughs> this is what they're saying. The union, last part involved, the union would thus seem to have emerged stronger with a larger number of citizens than before supporting the idea of remaining in the EU. It was actually a blessing in disguise. Um, so uh, the EU eventually <coughs> presents the exit of Britain as a benefit. Okay? So the idea is that now that the UK is out, or almost finally out, we can get back to our business. Look at this example. Actually, this is, uh, these are excerpts from my passage. They say, um, UK's withdrawal, that there are many constructive possibilities that may follow from the withdrawal. Um, and UK's departure 
should at least be a chance for a decent reassessment of the state of the union. So there are different things that um, were somehow being slowed down by the presence of the UK in the, in the EU. And now we can finally put everything back in place and get back to our business. Brexit will open a window of opportunity. Of course, they're referring to the implementation of the Lisbon Treaty in foreign affairs or the economic and monetary policies you can read from the examples. Last example from the Brexit corpus. Um, there is a strategy of reversal for the purpose of positive self-representation. So um, this is adopted to throw new light on issues that are causing disagreement in the UK. So sorts of um, yeah, contrast between, between the UK or the EU or aspects about which the UK was very resistant or things that had opted out. So the EU, EU stresses its uh, successes by saying that what the EU, sorry, the EU is basically stressing its achievements, its successes by saying that what the UK saw as a problem is in actual fact a key achievement. So here we're talking about the uh, free movement of people, which is why the EU is a great achievement rather than a problem uh, to be managed. <coughs> okay. So, um, yeah, the study uh, briefly, I'll uh, just try to, uh, to um, summarize the uh, results. Um, I think that the study delved into these discursive practices enacted by the EU to legitimate itself as a, as a policy, respectable and acceptable policy over time. Um, the results suggest that the EU is increasingly building its role as a, as a responsible agent, okay? So active, as I said, problem solver, um, providing grounds for its accountability. Values and elements of identification mainly promote benefits and opportunities, and therefore there is a change in the communicative, in social communication purpose of these booklets. So at the beginning they were, they were very referential, they were very just informative, and now they become very dialogic, sometimes even sorts of uh, commentary <coughs> in their function. And higher dialogicity uh, through the use of conversationalization, for example, we saw questions and question and answer formats. So, um, to uh, come to my conclusions, uh, this study was meant to put forward something novel, which is a methodological discursive approach to EU, uh, EU integration studies. So one of the purposes of this study is to open up a critical dialogue between disciplines and include these core studies in the theoretical spectrum of the study of politics. Uh, Moll says something very uh, inspiring, he says some political scientists in the past understood that discourse theory contributes to the critical renewal of EU studies because they draw attention the semantic, pragmatic and rhetorical aspects that are constitutive of social structures and identity. So <coughs> through discourse studies we can actually conceptualise EU, the European Union and EU events. And um, I was happy to see that the results of my um, discourse analysis were somehow uh, dovetailing with uh, some major theories in the field of uh, um, European integration studies. First of all, I'll just we already discussed this taxonomy, um, but I found the socialization model very inspiring. So according to this model, the more aspects of our daily life as citizens are positively impacted by the institutions, the more likely we are to embrace the European <coughs> Okay. So citizens identify with the EU provided it is salient to their personal lives. This was theorized in, in political science first. And then of course the normative dimension. This was theorized by Bridget Lafan, and she says that um, promoting rights uh, suggests and creates, constructs a feeling of belonging a sense of also shared values. So we share something together. We're therefore driven by the same interests. Okay. This is my last slide, um, which leads me to uh, refer to this, again, interdisciplinary dialogue, which confirms that 
my belief, so this course performs a central role in the conceptualization of institutional identity. And this study wants to encourage <coughs> the replicability of the investigation. So it would be very interesting to see this method applied to future events of the European Union. So I would like it to inspire, inspire new research on the relationship between the ever-changing and ever-challenging events that animate the European integration process and the language practices that are used to serve this political purpose, the political telos. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Uh, do you have any questions? So do you think this uh, process of uh, dialogicity, uh, conversationalization, could eventually lead to well, almost total disinformal communication from the Why not? to our children? That's a, that's a very good point. Why not? Uh, everything is becoming extremely informal. I, I was uh, actually taking a look at the um, Facebook page of this initiative, and it's so incredible how Claudia and I are doing a fantastic job in this respect, but it's also by making everything more informal through even a specific meeting, which is, as we know, the message, like Euron said. Um, you, you tickle interest and you, you do convey a feeling of proximity. Uh, and actually I want to thank Claudia because she published on the Facebook page of Discovery Linguistics, Linguistic Discoveries, is, uh, references to the latest initiatives in the field of communication policy. Uh, and I was very happy to see that language is everywhere. So the very first one is called New Narrative for Europe. And the second one is the Citizens' Dialogue. This is an initiative that was triggered by the publication of the White Paper on the Future of Europe for the 60th anniversary of the Treaties of Rome. And you see, the logo summarizes in a nutshell everything I've been talking about. They say, it's about Europe, it's about you, let's talk. <laughs> okay? So they finally understood, and that happened in 2005. And you just have to step on the pedestal and address the director. So I think you do have a point. Thank you very much for raising it. Other questions? So we can we thank Professor Aliendo. Oh, I'd like to thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.